So he would have had a few run-ins with Liam Hassett on the sideline, yeah. over and back. But he'd never turn and face Liam Hassett. So what Jim Gavin would do, he would face out in the field and start saying to Liam Hassett what he wasn't happy about, <laughs> like he's talking to one of his players. <laughs> like he wanted no headlines, <laughs> but he was talking to Liam Hassett. God knows what he was saying to him, but he was looking out on the field at Hassett oh, while he's on. Mickey Hart here, you're listening to GAR Football Show. The GA Hour with Colin Parkinson is brought to you by Paddy Power, home of the Money Back Special. I'm not finished yet, it took me a long time to get here. There's only one place to start, Conan, and that is with the shocking news that came out over the weekend um, that Jim Gavin has stood down. Jeez, this really came as a surprise because, let's be honest, this was not planned for him to step down. There's no one even attempting to say that this was in his mind. Something has come up. We'll never know what it is because Jim Gavin, to say he yeah. keeps his cards close to his chest, the statement from the county board had no, board had no quotes from Jim Gavin. Yeah. I love him for that. <laughs> like he is the opposite of, like there was no GPA retirement template and thanking yeah. everybody. He wants nothing. He wants, he just wants the story to be so far away from him. And that's massively uh, to be respected, to have no ego at all, to make it all about everybody else and not about himself and he after doing what he's done for Dublin to just slip out yeah. with zero fuss and it'll be managed that there is no fuss no huge headlines from him or any of the players Jack McCaffrey was supposed to do a uh, media day this morning and that got pulled on Saturday evening so there, there, nobody's adding fuel on to the fact that he's gone and that's it he's just going to go yeah. and that's it it's amazing it does say a lot about him like, yeah, like he's one of the most successful managers ever and he is Deliberately trying well, to no, just no <laughs> manager has ever done what he's done in yeah. in seven years. He's won six All Irelands. He's lost one championship match in that time. Like I mean, like, I don't know. I don't. I would never get into arguments about who's the best manager oh, of all time. But he's yeah. in the conversation. Of like, course I mean, he is. Yeah, he's the only one to do five in a row, obviously as yeah. well. So he's an, an immortal, and he's trying <laughs> to just avoid all fanfare <laughs> and not even have somebody else say that he's great. Yeah, thanks for everything. He yeah. just like pulling the Jack McCaffrey interview. See, I don't think Jack would have pulled that himself because Jack was probably you know maybe an ambassador for mm. whatever he's doing or whatever. And I'd say Jack wouldn't have ex exactly enjoyed doing it and having to answer all those questions. But those Dublin lads are experts at not saying much and saying, look, well, Jim was great. I'd say that was a Dublin County Board decision coming from Jim, potentially to pull that, <laughs> not to keep this story ticking over. Yes, yeah, it's, it's mad. Like, God forbid somebody will say something <laughs> nice about you. Like, you know, when I was actually, um, I was at a wedding on Saturday when I heard I was a groomsman and at the communion, somebody leant down and whispered to me Jim Gavin's <laughs> retired and I thought it was a wind up there for the next half hour I was actually going to run out and see like said, geez Willie might need me to do a podcast now <laughs> but um, yeah it's unbelievable and it is like it's the end of an era and as much respect as I have for him I can't help but feel a little bit excited because just, just as a neutral I think it will go a little bit towards levelling it up because I think he was so good and I yeah. don't know if somebody else would have oh, won I think five in a row. There's no doubt about that. I think that it's a definitely, uh, there's no, it's going to be a downgrade no matter who takes over from Jim Gavin because let's be honest, he was exceptional. Now, if Jim Gavin went to manage Leash, I wonder would he be able to do the same job but Jim Gavin was the right manager for this team of Dublin players. He, he organised, he made them egoless, he had humility, was the huge kind of trait he wanted from them. To manage that Dublin senior football team, he managed the media, he dampened down all talk about them. To do what he did, and that's his army background, and there was maybe that's the perfect man to manage a team like Dublin, is to dampen all this stuff down, you know? Like if he went to another county and had to actually try and promote football, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like that wouldn't suit his personality. He was the perfect man for that job. And the five in a row, I, look, to be honest, I think it's a great way for him to go out. I think he should have gone out. Like everyone was saying, he was really relaxed after the All-Ireland final. He gave little anecdotes about Cluxton looking mm. at the laptop and you would think he was gone. And then where do you go from there? Like, I think it's the right decision, but it doesn't seem like the decision was made on footballing terms. Like Maliki Clerken is speculating that it, it was a job offer. I saw in The Independent, I think it was Colm Keyes speculating that maybe Darcy's going to go and Paul Clark might be going. And it was like, you know, the team is being broken up. Nobody knows, you know. But like, I mean... He sent a text on Friday evening, completely out of the blue, and, it, and arranged a meeting at Dublin Airport. This is with the county board on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. So he told them then that he was done. Um, from there then, the, the Dublin senior football team was getting their pictures taken for a five in a row. This was pre-arranged. So he told the county board before that, then he headed off, uh, It's where is it, Inish Falls, 
uh, Inish Fails, is it? Inish Fails, Inish Falls, Inish Inish Falls, Road, yeah. on the Malahide Road. And he told the team then, and none of them were expecting it. So the plans were in place for next year. Like something has come up yeah. to change his his mind. Um, we know, look, we know his record. He won 21 of 18 titles that were on on offer. 44 of 48 championship games won, three drawn. Um, three of them were all in finals, funnily enough, <laughs> and he'd only won one loss. But that's it. Like Sean Shanley, the county board chairman, said, <laughs> as pure Jim Gavin, he simply said it was the right time to go for Dublin. See, this gets kind of a little bit confusing, and he felt it was the right time for him to go and leave it to someone else to carry on. So that's a bit confusing. Like Sean Shanley might have broke rank to even say that. So like if he thought it was the right time to go, why leave the other manager coming in with so little time? It's nearly a burn cup. No, yeah. they're not entering the burn cup, but it's nearly, it's less than two months to the league. The new manager won't have the burn cup now because they, they obviously not entering it. There's a team holiday. Does Jim Gavin go on that team holiday or does the new manager go on the team holiday? I'd say Jim Gavin goes on the holiday and the new manager doesn't, which makes it even a little bit awkward as well. You know, <laughs> like a new manager would have organised the holiday, would have made sure potentially a holiday was booked before Christmas. Yeah. So there's a lots of things that doesn't really make sense with this. Yeah, look, it is. It's it's very, very bad timing. Like, you know, and that's why I do think it must have been something else that came up. I, I don't think he would have left him like this. You know, if he was planning on leaving, he would have done it a month yeah. ago. So why is Shanley saying he simply said it was the right time to go for Dublin? <sighs> so obviously he's not telling them the reason either. Yeah, like the right time to go for Dublin would have been in October. Yes. Or like, you know, yes. September even. Um, do you know, and obviously, like, it's hard to hold it against him, but it's, it is bad timing. Like, you know, I think that you have in the notes as a 54 days to the National League or yeah. something like that. Like, the, you know, and we always talk about how new managers come in, they need to get the best coaches. You're trying to get coaches together now in December. Well, Dublin don't have a manager yet, so when they get him in, now I know they'll probably pick Dublin player, like, based people anyway, but the backroom team was like 24, 25 people. You have to start pulling all that together now in time for a National League yeah. in January. And like your favourites you're all earning contenders everybody's always out to get you anyway so Dublin need to be hitting the ground running and it's just it's, it's an uphill task for a, a new manager this late yeah the new manager is looking like it's going to be Pat Gilroy or Desi Farrell so the talk is that Pat Gilroy might be offered it but he there's a, I'd be surprised if he takes it he had to leave the Dublin hurling job um, because of work commitments so you'd be surprised Desi Farrell looks like the next one in line that's like just keep it kind of you know the continuity there he knows all their players he won an All-Ireland with most of them in 14 and with a new batch of them like Howard and Conor Callaghan and these lads in 2017 I think the only, there's only something like three players um, that he hasn't worked with that's right. Cluxton Keen O'Sullivan Johnny Cooper and he's a club mate of Johnny Cooper do you know what I mean so like he knows all of them he's yeah. the obvious one um, if Gilroy doesn't want it Gilroy would be held in hugely high regard because let's be honest Jill Gil Jill Gilroy or Pat Gilroy changed the culture in Dublin in, in the Dublin squad he won he got them over the line he did for me he did the really hard work Jim yeah. Gavin um, took it on from there yeah because part of me thinks that the Pat Gilroy would be a safer bet even though Desi Farrell's work with him and it seems a bit of continuity but like you say Gilroy started the culture and it's one thing like you know having that culture that Jim Gavin created in the dressing room and no egos and stuff like that but it's it's the hunger to come back every year like you know how hard it is to try and win something the following year yeah. but Dublin had that fuel every single year and like it's not like they were like they coached a lot of the games but as you said they drew a lot of those finals they were outplayed by Mayo twice in 2016 outplayed by Kerry the first day this year but they kept going to the well and digging out what they had to do and that's something else that like you know, has come down from the management team and I think yeah. Pat Gilroy might be the better well, manager. Well I think I think if Gilroy takes them over and they lose a couple of games in the league next year there'll be no panic. Gilroy's been there he's done that he's won an All-Ireland with him this will be seen as look well Gilroy has this under control. Yeah. If Desi takes it over point. and they start losing a couple of league games Oh, we're gone. He's not up to it. He, this lad's not good enough. That's the difference. So there'll be a lot more pressure on that. Look, there's massive pressure on any manager to follow Jim Gavin because of the consistency and the brilliance and his attention to detail and all those things. I think if Desi takes them over, I would, I'd imagine that a lot of counties would prefer Desi to take them over than, than Pat Gilroy because yeah. Pat Gilroy seems like a more of a sure bet yeah. you know of being good than, than, uh, than Desi I think so I would love <laughs> I would love a manager to come in with a bit of an ego who wants to try something a little bit different rather you know Jim Gavin obviously just created this these amazing formulas like you know a couple of them just to get around whatever faced them I would love somebody to have a bit more arrogance thinking no nah, no nah, we're a better team we'll just go out and 
it's like the way Dun- like Dublin were in 2014 and they got caught by Donegal yeah but you need that bit of an ego t- for to be caught it'll, like it'll, it'll be interesting to see how it how it works out there's no doubt about that there's some people saying now that uh, Stephen Cluxton will go now this is irrelevant to Stephen Cluxton's decision in my eyes like I mean Stephen Cluxton played under under other managers it's not like he's a relation of Jim Gavin yeah he's his captain and they have a good relationship Stephen Cluxton's loyalty is to Dublin not to Jim Gavin so I don't know why everyone's putting two and two together and saying well now Cluxton's going to go Cluxton's decision will not be based on this and I, I wouldn't think any of the players decisions will be based on Jim Gavin Jim Gavin was a manager for seven years very successful Pat Gilroy the one in All-Ireland um, Cluxton would have won a lot of Leinsters under Pillar Caffrey Irrelevant for me. I'd say Cluxton will be weighing up, is it the right time for me to go after the five in a row, immortality, player of the year? That's all in Stephen's mind. Unless it's another, you know, just one other thing to factor in. But it's not like, oh God, this is really going to make up his mind. I don't think it will. Yeah, like it, he's, yeah you're right. He's not, he's not Jim Gavin's captain. He's, he's Dublin's captain. So he captains yeah. all those players and that's who he spends most of his time with and most of the time talking to. The only like thing I would think of if I, if I was Stephen Cluxton is... Would you have the enthusiasm, the hunger, you know, when you're at his age now and then a new regime coming in? And we've got all these new plans and just be like, ah, you know, did all this already. Like, I don't know if I, if I can get back up to that level for you. I don't know, but for Cluxton, he doesn't need to be at Cluxton's 100%. almost like a little bit superhuman in <laughs> yeah. ways like that. I'd say he'd probably take it as a challenge. This, this fella's a, a fierce competitor, so maybe impressing another manager he might like. In a, in a weird way... Like we know Jim is brilliant. Maybe something fresh after the five in a row because you're in this weird position at six now where like the, the immortality has been done. It was never done before. Massively motivated for that. It could be a natural lull there anyways that a new manager might ensure won't happen. Now, I know yeah. Jim probably wouldn't have ensured it would happen. <laughs> yeah. You know, anyone that started coasting would be gone. You know, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of maybe a positive for Dublin of, you know, maybe him him leaving at this stage. Mm. Brian Fenton and Kieran Kilkenny did a, a do for our club back in Derry there a couple of weeks ago. And um, boys were saying, like, even after the panel discussion, he said that they wouldn't shut up about Jim Gavin and how great he was. And they just had such a good word to say on him, like, unprompted, they would bring him up and stuff. And right. So that sort of struck me, like, you know, the players are so fond of him. So yeah. It'd be interesting. Bro. And that's the thing. And, like, I mean, like I said earlier on, Jim Gavin almost you know put his own personal reputation as being a, a strange sort of a man yeah. out there for the good of Dublin because let's be honest they won an All-Ireland three in a row and he didn't even smile got a lot of criticism for that the way he conducted himself in interviews almost made him look like he's a strange individual mm. and people that would know him would know he's not like that at all and I remember before the All-Ireland final in football I randomly bumped into him in Temple Bar he had a few jars on board he was in Go- o- Oliver John Gogarty's yeah. like who would have known him in there only me <laughs> we were after doing a live show in the hurling and he was with a work crowd and he had a few pints on board and he was in good form you know and he's a fr- like I've met him before and before he stopped doing stuff with me like you know he had friends who played with Round Towers when they were younger and they would would say that's very unlike Jim the way he's acting like he's a per- more personable friendly demeanour then he comes across but that's the the personality he put across there to the whole country who wouldn't know him for the good of Dublin football yeah. so like I mean uh, there's things I don't like about him but there's an awful lot of things I do like about him and he's a legend and he's a Dublin legend and that's the way he'll be you'd, you'd swear he's dead the way we're talking here <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just leave it with him Fitzmaurice I thought this was a great little anecdote about uh, Emmett F- Fitzmaurice is great for, for giving you um, little bits and he was talking about, you know, Jim Gavin on the sideline. And <laughs> it's a classic. So he would have had a few run-ins with Liam Hassett on the sideline yeah. over and back. But he'd never turn and face Liam Hassett. So what Jim Gavin would do, he would face out in the field and start saying to Liam Hassett what he wasn't happy about. <laughs> like he's talking to one of his players. <laughs> like he wanted no headlines. <laughs> but he was talking to Liam Hassett. God knows what he was saying to him, but he was looking out on the field at Hassan oh, while he's on. Yeah, it's brilliant. So we don't it? pick up on it that, that he's rattled or that he's well, arguing. You wouldn't pick it up, yeah, that he was getting involved in a skirmish because that would make headlines. Jeez. So he's absolutely protecting this at all. Like the, the probably the best video I've ever seen of him was when there's a, a big melee at the end of a league game down with Kerry in in Austin Stack Park, yeah. and he just walks past it and doesn't even look left. Yeah. Like what manager in world sport wouldn't at least go in and try and pull his player away? You know, you know, like the duty of. Kerry. Yeah. He what well, it could have been one of them getting the shit kicked out of him, and Jim was just walking past this. He didn't even turn left to even 
be yeah. associated with this. <laughs> <laughs> the control of his motions all the time. Like Unbelievable. It, do you know what the saddest thing is? We will never now find out who it was recording Eamon Fist Morris that day. Remember we thought we had the conspiracy oh, yeah. that it was a Dublin person in the backroom team was recording Fitz Morris on the sideline. Yeah. And we'll never know. Look, find well listen, out. I'm going to I'm putting in a request with Jim Gavin for an interview. <laughs> yeah. I'm putting one in and that's it. Maybe he's out of this uh media manager's control now. You wouldn't know. Listen, you can only but ask. But anyways, that's it. So we'll we'll wait and see how uh how Dublin get on. It was interesting, there was a lot of oh there was a lot of tributes coming from Kerry to Jim Gavin. <laughs> Too many for my liking. It was like <laughs> cat thank God. Yeah. Um right, so Kilku yesterday like it was like a new team. And semi final didn't impress me at all. I thought Nave Connell would win it. They were outstanding yesterday, Kilku, especially in the first half and at the start of the second half where they really were the dominant team. Then went out of it a little bit. Um, lovely brand of football, all action, lovely diagonal balls into Conor Laverty, who, who's a target man. I always say a target man doesn't need to be Kieran Donaghy. Yeah. Conor Laverty, you wouldn't meet a smaller fella. All he wants to do is throw it left and right, a little bit like Ian Burke, yeah. and just opens things up. His hand passes usually open to play up. And then just the Brannigans, just attacking at will, <laughs> and the two Johnstons, and they just looked a completely different team. Yeah, the Ulster Championship looked like a completely different championship as yeah, well. Yeah, brilliant it? game. I was, and you know, I, uh, TG Carr picked the right one. I was completely yeah, wrong because yeah. the other one was the other two games were were one sided and boring. This was a this was a really really good game. It was brilliant, and um, like yeah, Kilku obviously faced a bit of adversity. They were by far the better team in the first half. They went seven points up, and I thought fairly so. And then suddenly they were getting one point up with two bad goals from their point of view. And what I loved about that was that they, they kept the players out uh, at half time like on the pitch. And for me, like that could only have been like relax, calm the hell down before we go back in here. Because you know yourself, you can see the two goals, you go into the changing room and everyone's just roaring and shouting and giving out and trying to give their toppings worth. I'd yeah. say that was all just a very like, sort of controlled way of just getting everybody to calm down. And somebody said afterwards that Moran was just completely calm and addressing. Conor Gilligan said that. Like half time he said was really calm. It was the calmest I've seen Mickey Moran in a long time because he knew the performance was very good. And if we could do a little bit more of that in the second half, we knew we had the beating of them in the full forward line. And like, I mean, that, that was reality. It is a weird one when you play so well in the first half. The team talk is keep going the way you're going where the other team are getting a kick up the arse. Yeah. And then, you know, I, t I find those halftime team talks you would definitely be concerned at halftime to be going a point in, you know what I yeah, mean? And then, you're, and then you're getting complimented. Yeah. Do you know? So, like, I mean, it definitely be in your in your head a little bit. Um, but, yeah, Mickey Moran's won four or five uh, Ulster titles now in the last four of the last five. And, you know, like, I mean, there's n absolutely no doubt uh, of what a brilliant manager he is. It was surprising to see Nave Connell go to long ball tactics. It's just not their gig. Now, they did yeah. get the two goals off it, they which was grand. Joy it they got joy and they were in sixes and sevens. And plus, Kilku put their full back Brannigan. I'm just going to call I'm going to call it by the <laughs> Brannigans because I won't remember their names. He marked uh, Thompson in midfield. So maybe... Nave Connell predicted that happening potentially and you know we're pumping in high balls because they were getting joy out of it yeah I saw um, like did they get that kick as well like I saw AJ Gallagher bouncing up and down it was Aaron Brannigan the fullback I think and he was like roaring his face at half time as they were running in so it was almost like yeah they, they have it going here but I was so surprised like a bit disappointed with Kilku and a little bit worrying maybe going forward just Every single ball went in, and they weren't always good balls or with good flights. Oh, they weren't usually good balls, no. actually. No, they were hopeful like balls. Hank Thompson played one nice, you know, one of those nice diagonal ones that had a nice trajectory on it. But apart from that, they were just dropping in and always landed to an Eve Connell player. Like, and they should have had an ollie goal. Somebody blazed it over. They would to be really disappointed with that. But yeah, they actually, <laughs> the way it was turning out, they could have went long a bit more, Eve Connell, because it worked every time. Yeah, no, it definitely did. There was a nice little moment I thought, and it just kind of sums up the respect they have for Mickey Moran. The game was just over and Ryan McAvoy got a, a black card. And you'd imagine, look, it wasn't the worst black card to take at that stage. And the camera panned to the sideline and Ryan's uh, apologising to Mick, Mickey Moran for the... <laughs> yeah. So, like, I mean, it's not like... The idea that Mickey Moran would have said before the game, if we're winning now, lads, get take your black card. Like, that's not... Like, he actually was <laughs> apologising to his manager for doing the right uh, thing, but it was the wrong... You know what I mean? Yeah. Ethically, it was the wrong thing. And, like, I, I can't... I've spoken about Mickey Moore a lot in this podcast I can't speak highly enough of him like you know when I only played with him or under him for two years at Jordanstown but you have to remember I was a fresher when Jordanstown were like competing for Sigerson's and stuff and 
Moran was in charge of the Freshers team. He was t- he was taking the the B Freshers team down the country as well. When I moved up into second year, I was on like the B or C panel. Moran was in all those games. Like he was taking control of them all, like all the sessions, all the games. He was just involved in everything. And I'd say like there must have been about what 60, 70 players there. Every one of them seemed to have that personal connection with him. Like it right, just has that effect on people? Yeah, that's what he's very good at. Another thing Kilku were very good at was getting bodies behind the ball getting it up to Laverty and making the ground up to yeah. give Laverty remember we were saying that if you're leaving him too exposed and that was the same with Derry Gonley Laverty didn't have those yeah. that support and number 10 Brannigan um, <laughs> he he did brilliantly in the first half Eugene to make was, Eugene yeah. to make those hard yards up and you know what I mean being that option for the throw off and um, you know Daryl did as well uh, number 7 Brannigan um, <laughs> he, he, he was getting up there as well yeah like I think he had 5 points from play from the half forward line in the first yeah, half yeah lovely show. football lovely yeah. football like I got this stage where Laverty actually thought he was just almost too honest where he was winning the ball and instead of pretending like he was going to go around he was just planted waiting for the runner yeah and he would always play a lovely hand pass but he wasn't like pretending I think like I know I love the game he's playing and he's throwing it around great he could shoot a bit more he yeah. shot in the second half and he scored a lovely. brilliant point yeah. and he's an ex inter county player like there are, were times I thought jeez he's been too selfless I now but maybe that's the game plan but at the same time stick it over the barrier you know like I mean I don't know. Maybe that's he's just following. He's following orders and just wants to be the distributor or whatever. But Kevin Cassidy tweeted after the game: "Many try, only the very best succeed." Three green hearts for Guido after the game. So like, <laughs> he he took a lot of flack for this uh, for this <laughs> yeah. tweet. Now, so he's working on the sideline for TG Cahar. <laughs> Um, his rival because it was weird because Eamon McGee when Nave Connell won the semi-final he was saying it's great to see a, another Donegal or Donegal mm. Club Football is where it's at whatever now Eamon and Kevin will be completely different characters uh, to be honest I've no real problem with a bit of trash talk usually that trash talk is among supporters it's unusual to see a player <laughs> do that and to do it so soon after yeah. it, like I mean Look, I'm not going to criticise Cassidy for winding people up because I absolutely love doing it. <laughs> yeah. I probably wouldn't have done it, uh, especially after being beaten by them in the county final. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's just the fact that... I, I don't, I, I'm not going to criticise trash talk. Yeah, I just... Uh, it's the fact that he is the player, I suppose, but also, like, he was the analyst at the game and he, <laughs> <laughs> he did it at the game as well. Like, um, I saw someone actually writing back to him saying... Uh, yeah, fair play to Cora Finn <laughs> because obviously they were the best and they went ahead. Like you know, well that's it. They, they, they didn't even win the All Ireland yeah. that year. Yeah. Um. But yeah, like I don't know. I I I, th- I thought it was bad time. And I looked at it and thought, ah, come you on. You wouldn't Kevin. like that as a true Gael like, now. You real, wouldn't. Real, see, I'm, Mickey I'm, Moore wouldn't do that. I'm not really a true Gael, so I don't <laughs> mind this kind of stuff. Joe Brawley yeah. will tell you that. I beat Joe Brawley last Thursday yeah. night. I didn't bragged about that you yet. Absolutely hammered him. Yeah, beat him say. well. Yeah, yeah, very convincing. Very convincing win. He started off well when he thought it was just. A, he said, "I thought this was the roasting of Colin Parkinson." <laughs> when he started getting into the actual debate, he didn't have much <laughs> to come then. No, no, he definitely didn't. So Nemo Rangers beat Clonmel Commercials easily. Um, 14-6 so I think it like was it 7-3 in both halves I think it was uh, 7-3 and 7-3 so I don't know could it not have played it in a better pitch far her field mm. it's like a bog the ball wasn't coming back up when it was being bounced it was heavy underfoot and you just see the contrast in that field to the next game Bally Hill St Mullins in Port Leash and a beautiful surface yeah. surely to God there's a better pitch down in Munster to play that on now I don't want to be too critical but it didn't make for a it didn't make for a good game. It didn't make for an exciting game. Clamell Commercials had some bad wides early on and I think that kind of, you know, maybe knocked the wind out of their sails. But without Nemo being scintillating or anything, just too good for them. And that was kind of in a really kind of boring game to watch. It I was very boring. And like, like Luke Connolly was obviously brilliant, but defenders very loose. Like nobody was up his arse. Like he yeah. seemed to be getting it very easy. He was picking up ball like without you know somebody hanging off him and he was able to turn and then decide what he wanted to do yeah like I started noticing the, the background it was lovely like where he was shooting into in the second half you know that's sort of where your eye was being drawn to them because you weren't that involved in the match the tide was out there and yeah, the, it was yeah, very yeah. far out yeah <laughs> the, so th- this is an incredible stat from Nemo Rangers and like I mean you just compare it like sometimes I think when, when you look at Port Leash's record sort of 21 Cork senior football championship titles and they have 17 Munster titles. Oh, only geez. four occasions. That is in a province with Kerry. Like, I mean, Christ, that's some hit rate. Like, and I mentioned him in a while, uh, Bruno McCormick retired. He's 16 county titles and two Leinsters. Like, he'll yeah. know himself that that's not enough. You want to be up five, six, seven there out of the 16. 
but they've 17 of 21. It's 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 just a phenomenal phenomenal uh, record. Um, Paul Kerrigan won his fifth. He made his hundred appearance. He had a nightmare actually. He geez, some of the worst wides I say yeah. he's ever he's ever kicked. He ended up getting a score at the end. He just had a, de- a terrible game in front of the post. That can happen sometimes. It's happened to me in matches where you almost laugh out of embarrassment when you've hit the fo- your fourth or fifth <laughs> wide. Like <laughs> honestly, that's it. it's just uh, for some reason it gets inside your head and then you're tentative and it just uh, it happens like that. I did feel for him a bit, but. He has 100 championship appearances. His father's 101 and Dinny Allen is 107. So they're the three top three championship appearances for Nemo Rangers. Would you uh, refuse a shot at that stage? Never. No? No. No, no, I'd be too, too pig-headed now to, do, to, to not. Yeah. You'd keep going, no. you keep going until, until you get one. That would be one thing I would always continue to shoot. <laughs> 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 I'm not saying that as a compliment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Nemo obviously got revenge for Clonmel Commercials and their manager, um, Clonmel Commercials manager was talking about them being a better team now than they were in 15 when they beat uh, Nemo Rangers. I might disagree with that. Um, I suppose when Michael Quinlivan isn't playing well and he's kicking wides that mm. kind of and a terrible moustache as well how could you play well and look, going around <laughs> looking like that so like I mean that's kind of ah look there's not too much more to say about that game Nemo go rolling on they play Curra Finn so they got revenge over Clonmel Commercials now for 15 and now they have a chance to get revenge on Curra Finn for getting mauled up in Croke Park in the all Ireland final um, two years ago so it won't be in Croke Park this next game it'll be just after Christmas it'll be in a ma- pitch maybe like Farher Field yeah. bring it on Cora Finn will be their attitude yeah it's a great semi-final like, you know when you think about it and Mickey Moore against you know the Leinster champions Bally Bowden like it's going to be um, yeah no, uh, Kilku will be oh Mickey Moore against yeah. Bally Bowden yeah well you imagine it's going to be Bally Bowden jeez I don't want their old I know supporters I am, I'm sort of writing them off a bit here like, let's just cut this part of the <laughs> <laughs> right so Bally Hale Shamrocks beat St Mullins I'm not going to ask you about this because Brian Carroll is on the line to talk about this one. So it was an easy enough win in the end, um, Brian. Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, St Mullins, in the first 10, 15 minutes, they played probably like football, really. They filtered the 12 players back inside their own 65 for large parts of that opening quarter. Um, made it difficult for Ballyhale. You know, they really they were really up for it, obviously. They had a huge crowd over on the terrace side um, in Port Leash. Um, and they were really buyed on by the, the early stages. They actually took the lead, went five points to three in front. Yeah. Um, it looked like they were actually really troubling Bally Hale. Um, but like if you just obviously been at the game, it's a lot easier to tell than, than watching it um, on telly. Bally Hale, this, all their backs stayed in their six positions. They didn't panic. Um, their own half forward line started to work back out the field. So that <coughs> in, in tow started to. Um, drag out some of the St Mullins players and Ballyhale then just worked the ball through the lines or when it was on they were able to strike the ball um, long into space rather than in that crowded area so you know they didn't panic um, eventually they got some of their shooters on the ball Adrian Mullin and Brian Cody got a, a few on the bounce as well so um, by half time then they did open up a lead in 11-7 Yeah Brian Cody Brian Cody got a few couple of good ones uh, before half time when he had to Evan Shefflin man marked James Doyle and he just he, he 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 got the better of him in the in the aerial exchanges, anyways. Yeah, strange one from St Mullins, like playing him out wing forward. Like I, I thought they should have moved Dial. They should have tried to get him more into the game, more central role, because they only probably got him on the ball three or four times. And when he was on the ball, he was very dangerous. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was a crazy move, and I, I, you know, I thought especially going down the home stages, home stretch, and they were really chasing the game. They could have thrown him in full forward. I know jo- Joey Holland was playing well in there, but you know, Dial is a big man. You never know what could happen if he was in a full forward. I thought it was crazy, crazy tactics, being honest, well, from St. Mullins. And it, it was kind of the turning point of the game then was James Dial. He hit the outside of the post at the start of the second half, and straight away then after that, TJ Reid catches the puck out. How many times have we seen this and runs for, through and gives it to Colin Fenley? And how many times have we seen him almost bully a ball in over the over the end yeah. line, like and just bat it in, in over the goal I, line? I just thought it was the contrast, though, um, and not being overly critical on James Dyle, like, because it was a wonderful shot and it was so close to going in. But I, I there was just a man inside him, and if he had it popped it inside the way TJ Reid did, I thought it was a certain goal for Sam Mullins. Um, and you know, just I just thought it was complete contrast. Then the ball poked down to the end of the field. TJ could have shot. Um, but saw Fenley inside and he, again it was guaranteed goal so it just shows that we've said this time and time again the selflessness of TJ Reid he's not going for the for the 
um, headlines all the time um, and just wants to, to get that ball over the line no matter who puts it over. So yeah. I think that was something that people can learn from. I thought the composure of Colin Fenley was outstanding for the goal though because the way it was thrown over he kind of almost done a pirouette and a semicircle it, to even have his bearings when they, they, by the time he caught it the easiest thing would be to shoot from a hard angle but he's, the goalkeeper kind of made it easy on him maybe and rushed out and he just had to give the, the smallest of side steps. Yeah he got around and actually he did well because he flicked it with one hand as well because that's not easy especially when you're falling so um you still would have nearly expect him to strike the ball with two hands. and he, he got challenged that he was striking the ball as well, so he did do well. But he's so big and strong. Yeah. There's there's many times, if you're watching him in a full forward, he's starting behind the full-back. The full-back has read the ball maybe before he has. But whatever way he is able to get out, he's obviously quite fast, but he's able to get out and just get a hurl on it or get his body in front of it and just make things really, really awkward for a full-back. Um, he must be a nightmare to mark. To but I wonder, fair. does he do that at the county level? Because I'm thinking now, as a club fullback whose first touch might not be great, it might actually make sense. Would you ever do that as a corner forward at club level? Maybe go, I'm going to bank on this lad not getting this up, you know, on the hurl, or give him a little nudge, and suddenly you could be inside. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that's that's what he seems to be doing the whole time. Is trying to play the ball through to himself, um, and either he's obviously going to pick up the pieces, or one, two, you know, one of the two corner forwards is going to be in there on the break. So. Um, you know, he's very, very clever, obviously. But um, he's some man for goals. I was reading the stat earlier, he's 11 goals this year or something like that. So it's it's it's, it's serious going, to be fair to him. No, no, it definitely is. So Richie Reid was out for Ballyhill Shamrocks. Did you notice them down on the pitch, Skyping him? <clears throat> I was wondering what they were at, being honest. It was only when I saw it back on social media that... Um, that it was they were actually ringing him and uh, getting through to him, so that that's actually a nice little touch. Ah, it was a very nice. Seen them all going to go mad with the phone, all right? Yeah, it was. A, he's out in the Lebanon on peacekeeping duty, so like I mean, obviously bored out of his mind if Colin Fenley is anything to be. <laughs> to did, 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 did the game peter out then after the Fenley goal? You know, like there seemed to be a good atmosphere, but like the, realistically, the game was over after that goal. Yeah, because they got a goal and two points within like three minutes there after the restart, and. Like, it was just so close, you know, you're talking that 20 seconds, that pivotal 20 seconds where if James Doyle goal had went in, um, we have a game, more than yeah. likely, yeah, you have, a, you have a savage game on and then just Ballyhale do what kick any teams have done for years, let alone Ballyhale do it, just putting the game to bed so soon. So it did, like they had, they, they worked up to a nine point lead there and they just kind of kept them at arm's length from that, you know, um, same ones could never really get in beyond seven points, six points maybe was the most they got into um, and really they were very reliant on Marty Kavanagh he went out to midfield in the second half and fairness to him um, he, he kept going he was obviously good in the freeze um, but he got three points in play as well so he is like look we've been talking about him a, a good bit as well throughout the season his performances with Carlo have been excellent but he is he is top class Oh, he, the point he got in the first half where he sprinted up and then stuck it out stuck it over off his left hand side that was a sensational score yeah and the, the the big thing about that was he, the way he's able to let in the the hurl in his hand and strike it such such a such a good strike on the run from yeah. that distance because that's a hard thing to do oh, when you're is, striking yeah. it off your left hand side and you know he the hurl completely lent it out and um, you know it was a great strike it, it was just it was just strange I, I know they brought him to midfield and he did get a couple of points out of midfield but um, I thought they should have been targeting Michael Fenley a little bit more um, you know as I said James Doyle out in the wing. And then um, he, he was at midfield in that second half. It's just while Pally Hill protect Michael Fenley and to protect you know that whole half back line with their midfielders and half forward and drop him back. Um, you know Fenley's you know he doesn't have the legs that he used to have. Yeah. And, you know this, this certainly should be um, should be maybe targeting him more. Actually speaking about Michael Fenley, that second yellow card, um, I thought that was an absolute farce. Being honest, there was no way that was a second yellow card. I thought. Um, that was a bit of a joke. It was, a, you know, you, I know there was the time was up and it doesn't matter. He he won't miss. Um, no, no suspension. He yeah. won't miss it. But but at the same time, you know, if we still had the old rules in, he wouldn't have been able to accept a cup. You know what I mean? Because he was captain. So right. just small. And no, and no one likes getting sent off. No, you know, even if it was innocuous or not. How, how good are Bally Hale? It's a pity. They, it's a pity. I know it's great for St Mullins to get to the final, but it's a pity that they haven't been able to take on Kula. They won't play in a Piersig this year. You know, the Kula and the Piersig are exceptional club teams or have been Ballyhale I think are in are definitely on their level you just love to see them play each other now I know they, play, they played Ballygunner who were up there as well and beat them last year like I mean this is Ballyhale Shamrocks who are odds on now to go on and win back to back All-Ireland titles 
Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying. Um, I actually was a little bit disappointed to say Mullins yesterday in that they didn't have a, a real goal. You know, that to me it was negative tactics in the first quarter. I know you can say it was working, but like St. Mullins are a serious team. Like they beat Kula by going at them and they beat Rat Down the Earl in a thriller as well yeah. by going at them. And, you know, they have serious firepower, firepower up front and they're very, very dogged at the back. So I just thought they, they probably undersold themselves and, and gave Ballyhale too much respect um, by playing that style of hurling. They were very conscious of trying to get their matchups right. And I, I think they actually overthought it. Club hurling, I think, I think they showed it themselves. Anything is possible. So I would have preferred if they had a go. But I definitely take your point. It would it would be amazing if we saw this Ballyhill team play against Cool and their pomp or Napiersig in the pomp. Because, um, you know, they've been the, obviously the other two best teams over the last number of years. Um, Ballyhill looks to all intents and purposes that they're going to win two in a row. Um, but it's Slack so. Neil next, right? So that's the All Ireland semi final. Yeah. Now, look, I saw Slack Neil um, live. I saw them in the Ulster final. Um, they're awkward. They're big. They're strong. They're very, very physical. They play a sweeper. Um, they they're they're very organised and know what they're at and they have they have shooters as well so they will make it difficult. Um, I don't think it'll be enough, but they certainly will make it if they won't be up there to make up numbers. That is for sure. All right, Conan. So it's back to you now. And Maher Clune won the intermediate championship, um, the Ulster intermediate championship at the and I think it was on Saturday. Beat Gal Bally from Tyrone. And if you remember Maher Clune, they were the club. Whose pitch sunk into the yeah. into, into the mine? So half their pitch, their big hole in the middle of their pitch, and it's all sunk down to one side. So I thought that was interesting that they were able to go through all that shit in a year yeah. and still win the Ulster, in, win the Monaghan Intermediate title first, and then win the Ulster title. So they've they had to come across the the border into Loud to uh, to play home games um, throughout the year. So their club. Uh, account tweeted what a difference a year makes this is what dreams are made of well done to all the lads in management so that's a it's a fair turnaround for them there yeah no no border for monaghan people to cross i must uh, just get that in there before they, <laughs> they start cracking the up county that. border yeah. but um yeah like it is amazing like that they're able to do all this and obviously off the back of relegation last year as well so things weren't going well you lose your pitch and you're able to just round yourself up and win an also a championship and have one of your most memorable seasons. So, um, no, hats off to them. And, like, if you see that, like, it still looks like a bit of a disaster film, a big crack in the ground. Yeah. But, you know, so they're obviously training in different places, like, I mean, uh, trying to rent places and stuff. Like, yeah. I mean, they don't have training facilities or maybe they've, they've had to had to uh, get new... I wouldn't say they've had that, that ready or... What, no, they, haven't, where, they what? haven't had anything to train on, like, you know, and that's just... Um, it really like that just must be the biggest pain in the earth in the world. Like you take that for granted when you have somebody like another team in your club looking to train. You know how big of a pain in the earth yeah. it is, but they don't have a pitch all year to yeah. train on. Incredible. Tommy Freeman scored four <sighs> points from play. What a man! Lovely, lovely to read that. If a uh, player I really liked watching, uh, the speed of him was yeah. was sensational. So like he's still at it. I never really knew what club he was with. So there you go. Yeah. Tommy Freeman got four from play. 11 years after he got his All-Star and he's still tearing it up for his club. Very good. Very good. Right, we want to finish up on two retirements over the weekend. So Ronan Sweeney, um, Moorfield, nine county titles. He won 13 finals, two Leinster clubs. Like I would say that two Leinster clubs out of nine county titles isn't that bad for Moorfield because I don't know if they were they weren't all Ireland kind of contenders you know not mm. a super club they, they, they were a very good club um, and then Bruno McCormack who's been playing for Port Leash since 1999 so 20 years he won 16 county titles in the 20 years so he played in 19 finals there's only one year he didn't play he didn't make a final so he lost three um, the three of those two of them were to Stradbally anyways um, maybe he just lost two. I don't. I'm not. I'm not too sure. He's only two Leinster club titles and only one All Ireland final appearance. Which, you know, and listen, there's no secret to everybody in Port Leash that is not an ideal stat for that generation of players. And I'm including myself in that because um, I was there for some of it. It's just probably you look back on it and look at the dominance in Leash and just didn't convert it in and beaten by really, really, really good Dublin clubs. Um, and I always complain about that weren't all their own players yeah. and whinge about that because it, it does annoy me but look I mean that's it that's the reality that the Dublin clubs were just probably too good one or two years and then o another two years weren't able to beat them um, and that's just I suppose not good enough so Ronan Sweeney he'd be a few years older than uh, Bruno so there two of them are gone be interesting to see what the two of them do 
to retirement of two club legends I have down here. Yeah, like Ronan Sweeney's always one of those names you just expect to never retire. <laughs> you know, when yeah. then it comes and hits. Well, he got injured then this year, didn't he? Yeah. So maybe that was the final nail. He's got a lot of man. He'll go into management. He's a lot of managerial experience already. He's in with Carew in Sligo mm. and he's in with Keen O'Neill in Kildare. Yeah. So I'd imagine that's his next step. Yeah, he got a knee injury. But Bruno McCormick, will will he be allowed to retire? Will he not just play intermediate now? Or well, I'm going to play junior. I'll be talking him into coming yeah. down to the juniors, <laughs> and we've to wait one more year to get him involved with the Leash Masters because he's only tw- 39 next year. So oh, we need geez. to get him the next year to wait around for him, and sure, he'll have ballooned out by by <laughs> by, the, <laughs> by the time that time comes. So we won't get any good out of him at all. Anyways, that's it. We'll be back with uh, Parik Walsh. So Tullerone are Leinster Intermediate Champions and Parik Walsh joins us on the line now. Have the celebrations died down there? Parik, I know you're back to work today. Yeah, back to work there today now, yeah. So we uh, had a great night after the match and a good day again yesterday. So, uh, yeah, I think we're all, um, there'll be a few shook heads today, today, but we're all back to work anyway. Yeah, yeah. Come here, Saturday day must be great for a, a provincial final like that. Oh, it's brilliant, yeah. It is absolutely brilliant because... You don't have to wait around the whole weekend for it, you know. The yeah. match is on the Saturday. There's no hanging around to the Sunday, and then you can relax for a bit after everyone is the day off the next day. So it's great. Like it's definitely you definitely rather than the Sunday anyway. Yeah, definitely. So you've been watching Bally Ragged, Carrick Shock, Craig Bally Callan, lots of teams that beat you in the intermediate go on and win the Leinster. So it must be nice to be back at or at the top of that pile. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's been a tough few years now. The last few years because it was. As you said, every team, every team we were watching, our teams who knocked those out of the championship, you know. So it was a hard thing to, to watch them games, but to be able to do it ourselves now this year is absolutely brilliant, and uh, it's it's just we're loving it now at the moment. We're really enjoying it, and it's been a great year. Is the pressure off you a little bit in Leinster now? I know, like it's easy to say that, but you were under savage pressure in the Kilkenny Intermediate Championship. Yeah, we were. The, def, definitely, the, the pressure is definitely eased off. Like there was so much pressure on us, we were probably putting it on ourselves to just go on and win the thing you know and ever since that like you're not even as nervous going to games now because it's you're just we're just really enjoying every game as it comes now because it's a it's something new for us the pressure is off and uh, we can really just go out and enjoy ourselves Right and is are the performance re- reflecting that like are you are you hurling with more freedom? Um, yeah I think that even people watching us have been saying that as well but I think that yeah I'd say we're, we're a lot more confident in ourselves anyway and uh just the, the few matches after since the county final we have hurled well in, in all to be fair you know and uh, so you have new lads getting into the team here now at the moment like our team has even changed since the county final so there's a real buzz around lads can see themselves getting getting their chances and you have new, new lads coming into the team so it, everyone's feeding off each other and uh, yeah we're definitely playing with a bit more freedom at the moment When you see all the headlines when you won the county title in Kilkenny like I mean somebody looking from the outside would be forgiven for thinking you were down in intermediate for like 20 years or something it was only four <laughs> you were <laughs> you relegated in the end of 14 and then you played four yeah. years and you, like I suppose it was the losses then was it that you know having some games won and letting it slip and then added to that you know the, the prestigious kind of club that you are you're the record our senior county title holders four years felt like probably a much longer time yeah. oh did it oh it felt like a long time because <laughs> we, just, we were getting so close every year you know and uh, it just at some stage or at one stage it was looking like was it ever going to happen for us you know but um, it was just we were just absolutely like if you, can, like, if you get stuck like, if you get stuck down intermediate you can be there for a long time you know you try to get back up as, as quick as you can so we were just delighted to finally, finally get up there because we have a good age at the moment in the team and so I think it was very important for the likes of Matthew Kio and Tommy Welsh all their, their age to get to Hull Senior. None of them got that chance before, so it's great to, for them lads to get a chance to play up against the likes of Ballyhale and these teams. Yeah, no, it definitely is. And with the, like, I mean, you did really well to come back because the worst probably loss in the four years was the one last year in the final when you were five up with seven minutes of normal time to go. You know, like, I mean, to recover and come back from that. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. This, this year was tough, like, you know, it's, and this year, probably performance wise, was probably our worst league, you know, and since since we came down. But um, just the, by the time Championship came around, we just got it right and we started hurling well at the, at the right time. Just got the timing right this year, and uh, we just haven't looked back, you know. We're just we're absolutely delighted to get over the line. It's the just everyone's just so happy down in Tullerone at the moment. It's a great place to walk around now. Cause everyone's just on an absolute high. 
Yeah. You just don't want it to end. Well, well, that's true. Well, it's not going to end for another while, although, like, I mean, it's, you don't have as long to wait now until the semi finals. Um, they're just after Christmas now. So, Christmas in, in the Walsh household and all the whole team's Walsh, or household is going to be a lot different this year. Yeah, it is. It's going to be very different. But look, we won't, we won't complain. It's, it's, it's a great position to be in, you know, getting ready for an all earned semi final. It's completely new for us. Like, we've never got to experience this. So, everyone's just so excited. Well, We'll take this week off now and uh, we'll get back into training next week and we'll be looking forward to that match. That's the best way to do it. So Shane Walsh, you're an, another brother of yours, um, scored 213 yesterday. So it's some shooting from him. Yeah, no, he did. Yeah, he had a great old game yesterday, so he did. Um, the second goal, though, he's trying to claim that one, but we're not sure if he did get it now. <laughs> we think Mark Welsh got it, but he's, he's claiming it anyway. But uh, yeah, look, he went well yesterday, but all the forwards did, they were... They really clicked yesterday, you know. We I think we got two twenty five yesterday. It was a, probably the biggest score we've got this year, you know. So um yeah, we're just delighted with it. Yeah. And like I mean, Shane's only twenty one, twenty two and he's captain. What was the thinking behind that? Yeah, he's twenty twenty three. Twenty three. Twenty three. But right. he yeah, he actually I think he decides himself at the start of the year <laughs> he wants to be captain. He was going around campus and telling guys to, to vote for him at the AGM, so I think I think he just forced himself into that role. He just decided the start years that I'm going to be captain this year, and he managed to convince that to, to pick him anyway. <laughs> I, I, I like the sounds of Shane now already. So, like, I mean, he he played really. <laughs> do, do, I suppose, brie- like, briefly on the game, like, it would ha- at half time, y- y- you had stretched out a lead, and then Sir Kieran's got a one-one just before half time to put a few doubts in your mind, and the start of the second half well, but then. Um, is another Walsh then uh, got three points in a row and uh, I think it's your cousin and, and you pulled away then after that yeah yeah it was it was yeah like the, the scoring doesn't really reflect the, how tough the game was like the Sir Kieran were serious we just kind of I think we just got goals at the right times you know but they were they were serious and like they were only in an Offaly semi-final two years ago and so we all know how strong club hurling is in Offaly so right. we knew that we were going to be at our very best to to, come, to, to, to beat them you know and was thank God we got the scores at the right time and then the second half we had a very strong breeze there so once we started to pull away it was going to be very hard for them to get back at us just because of the breeze you know Yeah yeah. so like I mean you, you played centre forward for Tullerone like for a good few years and that, and you swapped back into the backs this year and Tommy has gone from the backs up to full forward is that what's after happening? Yeah Yeah it's actually it's my first ever time playing the backs for Tullerone Right Played there when I was younger alright but um, been always in the forward so it's a uh, a nice change of scenery and he has to get back there for a while yeah no definitely sure Tommy there is you know, he's flying it up in the forwards as well so yeah, so, uh, yeah it worked out well for us this year anyway well maybe because you were so close maybe it was just a little kind of change like that you know maybe just to spark it and make it look like it's a new yeah, beginning maybe it. yeah just freshen things up you know and as we're saying like we've had so many new lads coming in this year as well and that's it's really picked up the train you know and lads just see that they have a chance of getting into the scene like I'd say we've three or four lads there yesterday who probably didn't play in the county final but were getting game time yesterday you know in the Leinster final so that's it's great for lads and it gives them a buzz and makes them want to push on for training the next day you know Right okay and like I mean are you well set now to stay up at senior you know like I mean I know Tommy does a lot of uh, coaching um, with the underage teams in the club um, Yeah well age wise we would be we we would um, age wise we'd, we'd have a good we'd have a good mix you know the likes of Shane and Matty Clone, their age group now, we've got a lot off their underage teams and right. they're only in their early 20s yet, you know, and we've a few older lads then to, a few older lads there with a bit of experience as well, but I'd say the majority of us now, um, only very few of us I'd say have played, have played senior hurling, so for the rest of them it'll be new. Right, okay, so how's Tommy performing? I saw one clip, did he set up one of the goals, he caught a ball or broke it down, I think that was the first goal, Buff Egan was recording oh, this from yeah, the stand yeah. in, in Nolan Park, so... Um, yeah, yeah. He's enjoying no, yeah, he's, 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 he is. He's loving it in there. He's absolutely loving it. You know, he's um, and he's great because our forwards are young enough, and it's it's good to have him up there to have a bit of leadership and keep things calm when when things are not going going our way. You know, and uh, he just works like a dog, and the rest of the feed off his energy up there. Yeah, no, exactly. Come here. I talked about moving back to centre back for Tullerone. Like I don't know how you must be dizzy with all the different positions you play in for Kilkenny this year. Like I mean, I'd say you absolutely love Hugh Lawler after after nailing down that full back <laughs> position. <laughs> after nailing down that full back position. So you're full back no, I, did, I, did, I didn't mind playing there at did all. Did you not? I liked playing there so they no my father was used to play a full back for the club so he was delighted when I went back there for a while <laughs> just <laughs> comparing us against each other. But no I didn't mind it at all like 
You always like, see because you, like, like, you always think that a player that loves going forward as much as you do would be tearing his hair out in a full back. Ah, yeah, but like as like as I'd say to people, like one of my favorite holders going up was JJ Laney, and he got moved in full back and never complained about it or anything like that. And when I got the chance to go in there, then I was like, you know, wearing the same jersey as one of my heroes. And you'd know all hickey there before him, you know, great lads that play for Kilkenny. So when you see yourself getting a jersey that they wore before you, it's um you nearly it's a it's a great honour really and they're just happy to be there on the team. All ah, right, I didn't really think about it like that, so I suppose um, yeah. it's a new ch- different challenge for you then. I'm just thinking uh, Definitely, yeah. the, the likes of Johnny Glynn and these lads floating around at full forward, it's like a, a daunting... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no matter where he is in the field, it's a, it's a, it's a hard <laughs> task to mark him now. So. <laughs> I was reading a stat earlier on this year, so in 33 matches, uh, since the t- start of 2014, Kilkenny have played 33 championship matches and only three players have played in uh, in all three. No one would be surprised about TJ Reid. Um, yourself and Paul Murphy are the other three. So, like, I mean, you're a real trusted lieutenant for for Brian Cody. You're just not sure where you might be lining out on any given day. <laughs> well, I'd say, look, I've just been lucky enough the last years with injuries. I've never got too many serious injuries or anything like that. So I'd say that's probably the only reason why I'm there like that, because I've just been lucky enough injury-wise, you know, but... Um, I, uh, look, I, look, I, to be honest, I don't care where I play once I'm on the team. Yeah. I'm happy, you know, because it's a hard thing to, to get that jersey. You just want to hold on to it and you'd be just happy to, to line out anywhere. Versatility runs in the family anyway. Sure, Tommy has won All-Stars in all, all in the back <laughs> midfield at four. So you obviously, obviously must have been swapping positions out in the back garden when you were younger and, and you never <laughs> regularly played in a, in a, in a set <laughs> position. No, sure. When you're when you're playing a small club like Tullerone, you're you're shoved around there, you know, because you wouldn't have great numbers, and you'd be playing with with teams when you're underage. You could be fourteen playing on a minor team, you know. So you're you're just being shoved in anywhere. So I'd say I'd say anyone in Tullerone could nearly play in any position they want. <laughs> Maybe that's a push. I suppose it's that versatility now in the the way the game has gone now. You know, it's a lot more fluid, and you're not stuck in your positions. Like cornerbacks are attacking now. When you see the way Wexford have brought the game to. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, like playing the full back line now is totally different than it was than it was a few years ago. You know, because you just you could find yourself in cornerback, you could find yourself out close to midfield, or as you said, you'd see lads going up scoring points and stuff. So it it doesn't really matter. You just have a number on your back now, but you could end up in any of the positions really during the game. You probably end up in the sixes during the match. You know. Yeah, at some point, if you had to pick one, because you got to run out in midfield this year, and you you played really well there. I thought that might suit you. If you had if you had a choice. Well, not telling Brian Cody because you've made it clear you'll play anywhere. Where, where, where do you like? To, where do you like to play? Um, I don't know. Sure, I'd probably like to have that play now at all because I'm in it. <laughs> so, um, well, yeah, I think that's always where where um, where I was most comfortable, where I enjoyed when I was younger, growing up. Up anyway, it was. Um, yeah, it's anywhere on the half back line now. I'd be happy enough. Right, right. Okay, come here. Before I let you go, I know you're on your lunch break. I want to ask you about yeah. a little anecdote that was in Owen Larkin's autobiography. You can confirm or deny it that yourself, oh. <laughs> your, yourself and him were marking each other in training. And this is no surprise that Kilkenny training can get overheat at times and lads can kind of, you know, <laughs> we've all heard the stories that you, you treat them like championship matches. And... Uh, he he was wrestling around with you and Tommy came out of nowhere and he, la- he lamped him a kick. Yeah. So do you have a recollection yeah. of that one? Yeah, he's. I think it was one year someone came in his, his, his own arc and he thought it was me. He turned around and hit me and the two of them fighting and and for Tommy ran in then he saw red and uh, one thing led to another. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, yeah, a bit of handbag stuff. But look, it was... Um, they were they settled it after anyway, they were happy out and they had a pint together in the All Ireland after that and Larks at the time claimed that was the reason we won the All Ireland, so, <laughs> so you were uh, yeah, it was Go on. Yeah, look, it was uh, yeah, it was just a bit of handbags, but that happens that they all all over the place, there's always rows and trains and usually that's the sign of when things are going well. Well, that's the so thing, and, and whatever it is about Brian Cody and you boys in Kilkenny, no controversies ever come out until you finish. You might hear something about them. You, you're able to keep all these little incidents well under wraps. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we would be thinking that's a big deal anyway, you know. Right, um, okay. But, uh, but sure, look, when he put in the book then, it, it kind of got blown up a bit, all right. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, it's funny, look, at the time, we, 
the time they were fairly tick at each other, but uh, it's, they'd be funny looking back at it now and they'd be flagging each other all the time over it. Right, right. Okay, so that's it. So, like, I mean, like I said, instead of the slabs of Guinness now, it'll be Ballygown or something into your house for Christmas Day, and that's it. <laughs> that's <laughs> it, yeah. But look, we'll. Uh, we're we're happy out preparing for Northern semi final. We won't mind at all. No, I'm sure not. Para, come here. I let you go. Thanks yeah. very much for taking the call. Lovely. Thanks, Colin. Thanks very much. Okay, so the Paddy Power performance of the weekend. First one has to be number seven, Brannigan Daryl. Um, my God, what a game this fella had! Like it was sensational. Talking about from setting the tone in the very first minute. Um, first couple of minutes anyways the first score of the game a punt off the out, off the middle of his right boot and I was like oh maybe he's a bit raw yeah. you know yeah. I wouldn't have, I would have cut in and tapped it off the inside you don't ever see the top players punting it like yeah. that it just doesn't happen it's years ago that kind of was <laughs> his goal was unbelievable uh, this was as good a goal as you'll ever see for so many different reasons the the stamina the the legs he had to make that run get bottled up go into no man's land look for all all intents and purposes is going to be a turnover he was surrounded his legs would have been burning with the lactic acid somebody else made a uh, fairness made a very good run from him made it easy on him gave it to him it could have been Devlin the centre forward I'm not mm. sure F- at that stage now his role is done yeah. Devlin or whoever he gave it to has to find someone else to keep this move yeah. going no that's not good enough Daryl continues on along the end line being held back by his marker, shakes him off, takes the second return back and rounds the goalkeeper. Now you've gone around him, your legs must be really like jelly and there's a space between two defenders into middle of goals and side foots it into the middle of goals. What a goal. What a bloody goal. It was unreal. Like there's so many, yeah, she says so many parts of it where somebody else would have just like the goal wouldn't have happened. You most players would have made that lung bursting run, passed it off and gone. Yeah. Phew, and then, like, so then if you take it on, then so when you get the ball back, most players then would look to pass it again or put it over if they can. But he just has a composure to like have a little fake dummy solo and take yeah. it around the keeper or a bounce. And then, as you say, like again, it's still hard. at this point, the finish shouldn't be underestimated. They put it in the middle yeah. of two players, like with a bit of power and accuracy. Yeah, and he does it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then the point he scored in the second half, I was thinking, geez, if he's punting it like that, he mustn't be good off the inside of yeah. his boot and stuff. And then he's like, he'd won wide from that side in the second half. But he, the point he scored, that's beautiful. That's flicking it off the, the inside of your boot. And, you know, like Conor Laverty from that side, I love, I always like, uh, prefer scores from that side. They're that little bit harder. Yeah. But they're, when you catch them well and you know it's going over, it's nice. Yeah, and that was what, after 20 odd minutes of them not scoring and a point coming. Into Very the important, game, he yeah. He just steps up. And again, he had played, he'd done this great run and played it off. And like, you know, will he just let the forward go and do his job now? He runs ahead and gets it again and puts yeah. it over. And he was also the one responsible for the first goal because there's a lot well, he of... He made that run, run, yeah. yeah he just the speed of him. Middle, yeah. Like, I mean, on the evidence of that, like he's a guaranteed starter at number seven for down. On the yeah. evidence of the speed of him, yeah. just the stamina and the, the finishing ability. Yeah. And like this is when you've got someone with electric speed like that from a standing position, he just made that goal happen. There was nothing on there. No. And, you know, Nave Connell, to their detriment, had paired off against players and were trying to stop it high up the field except for him. Yeah. And he just went straight up the middle un- it, unchallenged. Yeah. And he just draws so many players to them. And, like, yeah, as he showed a few times during that game, he was strong and smart enough to release it at the right time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Eugene Brannigan, I thought, was outstanding, especially in the first half. In the second half, he started brightly. And then he did a kind of goal chance on. He let that uh, ball go astray. He should have tapped that over. That was a bit of inexperience. Yeah. The what goal wasn't really on there. He should have just at least kept bringing it to bring the, f- bring the defender towards him and then give the pass. He gave the pass way too early. Um, but he was brilliant. And he, like, again, these Brannigans, like, I mean, I think it was Daryl said in the interview afterwards that he w- the, the competition is who's the fittest in the house rather than the fittest <laughs> on the team. And they look all like they're machines. They're machines for running. And Eugene, uh, you know, the pace and the, the legs he showed to get up in support. And he got two great first half points. Um, you know he was outstanding and again against um, Derry Gonley he didn't look that great I thought he was a bit raw mm. and he they were a transformed team it was like a different team Ryan Johnson was outstanding in the first half he looked like he is the perfect wing forward at inter-county level because he can get all over the field again the training they do must be unbelievable because he looks like he can run all day but he has that little bit of class at the end of yeah. it as well you know and like I mean as a wing forward, I know he plays in different positions for down, but I'd play I'd play him ten or twelve 
and have him like a modern wing forward you know like because these days your wing forwards have to be able to both work and have to be able to score yeah and he's a modern wing forward in that regard he sort of spins the ball before he kicks it doesn't he it's a bit of a weird sort of throw down yeah oh they wouldn't lack confidence those two yeah. Johnstons anyways I'd say there's no doubt about that Conor Laverty was brilliant as well um, really really good uh, just throwing it around real leader and played really well a man of few words uh, judging by his interview <laughs> last uh, last Thursday it was one of the more difficult interviews I've ever yeah. <laughs> had to do in this show uh, much more difficult than Parik Walsh in the last uh, part anyway because he was excellent um, Luke Connolly got five from play seven in total didn't sweep up the dressing room I think actually Nemo <laughs> Rangers made a joke of this last night so he was cleaning his boots and it tweeted out something they didn't have a br- they didn't have a a sweeping brush down here so Luke could show how humble he is or something so at least uh, they're laughing good, at the, yeah. at least they're laughing at themselves now um, and they understand it one beautiful point where he dummy dummy hopped it mm. and he dummy hopped it one way but that wasn't a trick he wasn't going that way he actually yeah. caught it and went back the other way yeah. which is like a, a, use the dummy so the dummy hop to come back the other way which yeah. you don't often see that one do you do you understand what I mean I do that because I was wondering at the start it looks like bad defending but he's just created all the space for himself by like the way he's moving his body yeah do you know and it's, that's what they always say um, follow the follow your man's feet don't yeah yeah like, don't, don't follow, follow the, the ball, ball. that's but what they're going to do when you are following his feet and he's going one way and then going the other and it's hard to sort yeah. of keep up with him he's such an unorthodox player isn't he that's why I love him like literally when he's on the ball anything could happen yeah. I love players like that you just don't know what he's going to do because he plays with supreme confidence there is no kind of concern in his mind that this might not work out for me or yeah, this is yeah. a bit too and I think there's a similarities with Kieran McDonald or some you know especially with the passes like I mean he just he wouldn't think twice of just throwing it up and it's, maybe it's the way he kicks it it's just like he really if he's going off the outside of the boot it's the most exaggerated outside of the boot you know what <laughs> yeah, kind yeah. Of, he does nothing by halves he's really and when he goes for a point like he's given that a f- he's like there's no Conor Callahan just passing it over like mm. he's walloping this ball over it's just the freedom he plays with and like you're right you know when I think of a good player if I was going to create a good player now today it has him look like Conor Callahan or something you know he'd, like he looks a little bit different like, like gangly yeah. yeah and he just does all the stuff that you sort of wouldn't be allowed to do you know he is the sort of player not to get all Joe Brawley about it but he would inspire <laughs> you like you know to go out and play then if you're a youngster just seeing yeah, what yeah, he yeah. does yeah he's enjoying himself out there yeah. and that's that's always good it's enjoyable to watch Colin Fenley um, scored a goal again yesterday between club and county he scored 11 goals in championship hurling over the last uh, year and a half so that's a stat Nile in work here had um, you know a trademark goal where he's literally bundling it's almost like a rugby try he's yeah. bundling it over the line and that's he, kind of the way he shortens the grip is amazing like yeah. you know, as a non-herder it's like like how did he do that so quickly like you know when he gains the presence of mind you know where he was they're going around with hurls since they were two ah, Conan who wouldn't know anything about this <laughs> <laughs> uh, Shane Walsh this was this is a classic so Shane Walsh obviously the youngest Walsh he's 23 now according to Porrick um, 213 captain of Tullerone and as Porik uh, said to me, he actually decided himself at the start of the year, I'm captain this year, lads. <laughs> 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 and nobody disagreed with him. So maybe he's thriving on this uh, leadership that maybe he thought he had in him. And that I don't know if this is true or not, but Porik yeah. joked about that. He said that he was canvassing early in the year that he wanted it. Yeah, well, once you put your money where your mouth is, then exactly. you have to start uh, backing it up. That's exactly. like a Colin Parkinson move. Well, uh, yeah, exactly. It is a little bit. So I said to Porik, I said, geez, I like the sounds of Shane already. So <laughs> you would, yeah. hopefully we'll see after him, t- you know, racking up those kind of totals in Leinster finals, we might see him in a Kilkenny jersey uh, next year. That would be fantastic. Uh, Stephen O'Sullivan. Uh, we didn't mention that Temple No won handy um, yesterday. Um, I was actually looking to see what Spillane um, scored in the corner. He only got two points, one from play. So he'd obviously be well marshaled. The other corner, Stephen O'Sullivan, he got four from play, six in total. Um, he deserves a mention. And again, of course, Tommy Freeman, um, who scored four from play. Uh, geez, he, Tommy Freeman, and he, Tommy's probably 38. He's probably not as old. He wouldn't be as old as me anyways. Um, I'm not sh- too sure what age he is but he's uh, banging in four uh, from play anyways he's going not too bad the winner has to be Daryl Brannigan there can't be any doubts mm. there can't be any kind of half uh, competitions with this he was just absolutely outstanding there's nothing I love more than an attacking wing back there's nothing I love more than a number seven the nicest position on the field <laughs> if you ask yeah. me and especially for a right footer 
to play I, I never understand why right footers play right half back and left footers play left yeah, half back you're it's right. so dumb because yeah. when you're running down your wing you're, you, the easiest thing is to sidestep off your left into your right and mm. flick it over the bar do you know what I mean it's, it's, it just makes it makes sense and it's actually the Nave Connell wing back to number 5 he, he was left footed yeah. and he scored two brilliant points did. you're better off be on the side that's not your, your good side because like at the end who anymore actually kicks a pass down their wing anymore oh, that's not kind of that's kind of it's gone out of the game it's an obvious pass <laughs> yeah. so you try and avoid them because you know from playing wing forward if you're the wing forward on the other side and the right half back has it your best run is to get the hell out of there yeah. because you can't he's just going to be right up behind you if you make a break for that it's too obvious you get out of there let the centre forward come and get it do you know that back in my day I hated going for those balls sometimes you have to go for them because it's the hard run yeah. but like it's it's a messy ball there's actually yeah there's nothing I hate more than a wing back coming right at me and I, I don't know where to go then I'm trying to time a run to come off his shoulder and you know, get back inside the pitch but you're sort of just waiting for him to to change the play or something yeah but like, even regardless of the point scoring it's if you're right footed on the left hand side no matter what time you come inside it opens up the pitch for you then because yeah. you're on your right foot with the whole pitch to look at yeah Whereas you can bang it foot, off the outside to the far yeah. side you can do what you want really you're that's cutting it. it you're cutting in on your good side um, I suppose that's it so yeah Daryl Brannigan um, Paddy Power performer of the weekend congratulations to him so that's it that's all we've time for. We'll be back on Thursday and we're going to preview the Leinster final. That's the last one of the year. Um, and we'll talk to you then. Good luck.